Today marks a very special day in the history of Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. This is the inauguration day for Dr. Jerry M. Anderson, a 46-year-old university administrator from Wisconsin, who officially becomes the ninth president of Ball State University. Dr. Anderson was named by the Board of Trustees last January to this position after a nationwide search for a president to head the 61-year-old university, Indiana's third largest state-assisted university. He comes to Ball State with impressive credentials. From his earliest experience as a speech professor at the University of Maine and the Michigan State University, to his administrative experiences that have included the chairmanship of the Department of Speech and Dramatic Arts at Central Michigan University, where he was also acting vice provost. To Western Washington State University, where he was provost and vice president for academic affairs. To his last assignment of vice chancellor and professor of speech at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. A well-organized, efficient administrator, Dr. Anderson is brought with his high marks from his professional colleagues and associates at all of the universities from which he's been associated. He is recognized for his work in university governance, planning and leadership, and skills in internal and external communications. He succeeds John J. Pruce, president of Ball State University from 1968 to 1978, who resigned to join the executive staff of Ball Corporation's international headquarters in Muncie. Richard W. Burkhart, provost and dean of faculties at Ball State University, who will preside at today's inaugural ceremony, was acting president last year. A native of Massachusetts, Dr. Burkhart is a graduate of Knox College and Harvard University. Ball State University is enjoying the third largest enrollment in the university's history this year, with 17,555 students enrolled on the Muncie campus, and graduate students at the Grissom Air Force Base at Bunker Hill, Indiana, and overseas graduate programs for Air Force personnel on 11 bases in Europe, and students studying in London and Dundee, Scotland, and opportunities to study at affiliated universities in Brazil, Latin America, Korea, Taiwan, and Mexico. This growing, expanding university with its five colleges, architecture and planning, business, fine and applied arts, sciences and humanities, and teachers college, has the largest freshman class enrollment in the school's history. According to academic tradition, the procession of delegates from colleges and universities is determined by the founding date of the institution. Hence, Sir Dennis Wright, the Sir Norman Angel Memorial Lecturer, who has been on the Ball State campus this week, leads the processional today as the representative of Oxford University. This ancient and distinguished university in central England was founded in the 13th century. Behind Sir Dennis Wright, comes Martin David Schwartz of Muncie, Harvard University's delegate to the inauguration of Dr. Jerry Anderson. Harvard was founded in 1636. He's followed by Edmund F. Ball, Yale University's delegate, founding date 1701. Mr. Ball is from Muncie. Otto N. Frenzel, the third of Indianapolis, is the delegate from the University of Pennsylvania, 1740. Howard Trivers, formerly of the United States Department of State, represents Princeton University, 1746. Wiley W. Spurgeon, Jr., Washington and Lee University, 1749. Among the representatives of colleges and universities from Indiana, 
are several college presidents. Isaac K. Beckus, Vincennes University, 1801. John W. Ryan, Indiana University, 1820. John E. Horner, Hanover College, 1827. Louis S. Salter, Wabash College, 1832. University of Notre Dame, Joseph Menez, representing Father Hesburgh, 1842. St. Mary's College, 1843. Concordia Theological Seminary, Melvin L. Ziltz, the delegate, 1846. Milo A. Rediger, president of Taylor University, 1846. Earlham College with Jerry Rushton, Delegate, 1847. Louis C. Gatto, President of Marion College of Indianapolis, 1851. Albert L. Jeffers, University of Evansville, 1854. John G. Johnson, the new President of Butler University, 1855. A. G. Hughley, Valparaiso University, 1859. Richard G. Landini, President of Indiana State University, Terre Haute, 1865. Arthur G. Hansen, President of Purdue University, 1869. Samuel F. Hulbert, Rose Hulman Institute of Technology, 1874. Carl H. Elliott, Tri-State University, 1884. Also among the Indiana College delegates are A. Blair Hulman, Manchester College, 1889. St. Francis College with M. Joe Allen Sheets, 1890. J. Lawrence Burkholder, Goshen College, 1894. E.D. Baker, Huntington College, 1897. Indiana Central University at Indianapolis, represented by Delegate Lynn Youngblood, 1902. Robert H. Reardon, President of Anderson College, 1917. Marion R. Lucky, Marion College at Marion, Indiana, 1920. Thomas F. Scully, Indiana Institute of Technology at Fort Wayne, 1930. Albert J. Butler, Bethel College, 1947. And Robert L. Kinnerk, Indiana Vocational Technical College, often called Ivy Tech at its network of campuses around the state, 1963. That's all of the Indiana delegation from the state's colleges and universities, but colleges and universities continue to be founded to meet the needs of the communities and regional areas they serve. Youngest is Sangamon State University in Illinois, founded in 1969. like inaugurations of the chief executives of the United States aren't mandated by law. They provide an occasion when academicians can gather from many campuses across the country for some collegial pomp and ceremony. Much of the tradition that one sees on an occasion such as this, or a commencement, when the professors and administrators don their flowing black robes and their colorful hoods and the square hat with tassels, frequently black like the robe, but not necessarily black, dates back to the 12th century at universities in Bologna and Paris. The long gown, the garb of the churchman and the layman, was necessary for warmth in unheated buildings almost eight centuries ago. Scholars, generally members of church orders, wore robes and hoods to protect their shaved heads. Later they wore skull caps and the hood became a cape which could be pulled over the head in unpleasant weather or used to collect alms from the wealthy in the community. As additional universities were founded, distinctive forms of caps and hoods were adopted. Strict rules were published, and tailors who departed from the acceptable style for the rank and the professor held were sometimes punished. The flat square motor board worn today originated at Oxford University. There is an intercollegiate code of academic costume which is reviewed periodically. You will notice today the different colors of gowns and particularly hoods. Colors often denote the subject in which the wearer earned a degree. For example, the doctoral gown is faced down the front with velvet and there are three velvet bars on the sleeve. 
Often those with doctorates in education have light blue velvet bars. Those in the arts, letters, and humanities may use white. Those with business degrees may have drab or sapphire blue velvet bars. Fine arts and architecture are brown, music is pink, nursing is apricot, science is gold and yellow. The university's board of trustees will wear scarlet gowns trimmed in black. For this processional, the Ball State University Symphony Orchestra under Dr. Arthur D. Hill, Jr. is playing Orb and Scepter Coronation March by the English composer William Walton. audience and singing the national anthem. Presiding today at the podium is Dr. Richard W. Burkhart, provost and dean of faculty. Dr. Burkhart was acting president last year. He's a distinguished academic and administrative leader, a former president of the North Central Association, who has been a member of the Ball State staff since 1952.
The invocation this morning will be given by the Reverend Marshall Calloway of the Glad Tidings Church of Muncie. Please remain standing after Reverend Calloway has completed his invocation for the singing of the national anthem. Reverend Calloway. Let us pray. Our Father, we are adults, but we come as little children in faith, in expectancy of thy presence today. We ask that thy blessings rest upon this great gathering. May we experience today the presence of him who made the world and all there is in it. The psalmist declared, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. May Dr. Anderson be that tree. Thank you for thy presence upon this great inaugural meeting. In Christ's name, amen. Assistant Professor Philip Ewart will lead us in singing the national anthem. stripes and bright stars through the perilous night or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the It's a privilege for me to welcome all of you who have come to join us today on this very happy occasion to celebrate the inauguration of Dr. Jerry M. Anderson as ninth president of Ball State University. We welcome you to the university and thank you for being with us on this historic event in the life of this community. It's our hope that you will enjoy this day and that you will have many occasions to return to this campus. It's now my privilege to introduce the members of the Board of Trustees of Ball State University. I'll ask you to reserve your applause uh, for them until I have introduced all of them. Uh, Mr. Alexander Bracken, President of the Board. Mr. Thomas Wallace, Vice President. Mr. Will Parker, Secretary, 
Mrs. Dorothy O'Malley, Assistant Secretary. Mr. K. Douglas Cook. Mr. James Garretson. Mr. Jack Peckinpah. Mr. Edwin Schoeiler. Would you recognize the trustees of the university? Please? We're very pleased to have with us this morning the following past trustees, past members of the Board of Trustees, uh, were able to return uh, and be with us on this occasion. And again, will you reserve your applause until all have been introduced? Uh, Mr. Thomas Harrison. There is Tom over here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Edward Robb. Mr. Gary Rawlings. Dr. Dean Spiker, would you greet these people? <laughs> Mr. Some of the officers of the university who are seated on the platform, I would like to introduce at this time, Dr. Robert Bell, Vice President for Business and Affairs and Treasurer, Dr. M.C. Byrell, Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students, Dr. Joseph Black, Acting Vice President for University Relations, Dr. Richard McKee, Assistant to the President. Will you greet these people, please? <laughs> We're favored this morning with the presence of four members of the Indiana Commission for Higher Education for the State of Indiana, and I'd like to introduce them at this time. Mr. George Delp, Chairman, Mr. Van Smith, past chairman, Mrs. Esther Bray, Secretary of the Commission, and Dr. George Weathersby, Commissioner. We're fortunate to have with us today a former faculty member who currently serves the state of Indiana as the State Superintendent of the Indiana Department of Public Instruction. Dr. Harold Negley, would you stand and be recognized? It's a very special privilege for us to have the governor of the state with us today to contribute to these inauguration ceremonies. Governor Bowen has always been most generous in sharing his valuable time with us at Ball State University. We're proud to note that in 1978, he accepted the honorary degree Doctor of Laws from this university, and therefore we claim him as a member of the Ball State University community. It's my distinct pleasure and privilege to present to this audience the Honorable Otis R. Bowen, MD, Governor of the State of Indiana. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Burkhart, Reverend Calloway. President Anderson, trustees, faculty, students, and guests. I'm here today not really as governor, but as a representative of Indiana's 5.3 million people. And on behalf of those citizens, Dr. Anderson, I want to bring greetings to you personally and to the community of people who make up Ball State University, an important and significant institution of higher education in our state. Today's ceremony marks the beginning of a new chapter in the history of Ball State, which has made major contributions to our state for many decades. Dr. Anderson, you are the focus of this ceremony because you assume the mantle of leadership at a time when higher education faces new challenges. After examining your qualifications and your accomplishments in higher education, I have no doubt that you 
and those who will work with you in their roles as trustees or faculty or staff or students will be equal to these challenges. So Dr. Anderson, welcome to Indiana and to Ball State, and I look forward to working with you in the interests of higher education in the months ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Governor Bowen. The installation of the president and the presentation of the presidential medallion will be made by Mr. Alexander Bracken, president of the Board of Trustees of Ball State University. Mr. Bracken. <clears throat> Governor Bowen, <clears throat> other platform guests, distinguished delegates from universities and colleges, members of the faculty, alumni, students, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, we very much appreciate your presence today and the opportunity to share with you this memorable occasion. A, a really a very memorable one in the life of this university, the installation of Jerry M. Anderson as its ninth president. I was reminded um, also not long ago had the privilege of uh, attending another inauguration ceremony of a president of a college and the speaker that day said that, that he felt that the inauguration ceremony was really a rather um, pleasantly archaic event which somehow had survived into the 20th century, along with the Fourth of July parade and uh, Columbus Day parades, an occasion to say useful and benign things for one another, to recall past glories, and to allow the relevant and college community leaders to take a bow. When I heard that, it, it, uh, it, sh it really shocked me because I couldn't disagree more. I, in fact, I think the analogies are not only incorrect, but I don't believe they're even very persuasive. It seems to me that the essence of this occasion is actually the formal conferring of authority. Colleges and universities are very much living institutions. They've survived for centuries. And certainly in the, in the history of Western civilization, uh, the college really preceded the, the nation state. And when you think of it, the president of a university really is a, a, a most influential officer. Of course, I should hasten to say, I think, that his authority is definitely limited. And indeed, um, I think only a casual perusal of the Ball State University faculty handbook not only details a rather um, ingenious means which have been evolved over the years to make sure that the president of the university is required to answer to his various constituencies. And I think this is good, but after all, it is there. But even with all these restrictions, the views of the president of the university are extremely important. They're given due weight, and in some situations, they're actually decisive. <laughs> also, um, I, well, the president can influence the selection of faculty, administration, students, and again, I think perhaps in some cases, trustees. He. Um, he, he really can affect the direction of change in the university. And I think this is something quite important and for all of us to, to keep in mind. And also, perhaps, what may well be the, the more important part of a, of a president's uh, impact on the university is that he can, as I see it, by his own example, 
help establish the standards of intellectual performance and ethical behavior <clears throat> that's going to be followed in Ball State University. And so I have come to the very definite conclusion in my own heart, and my own mind, that what we're doing today is important, and it's quite clear. The university community is entrusting real power to a new leader. And hence, I think it's quite, quite appropriate that the bestowal of this office should take place formally, in public, and with appropriate ceremony. Now, Jerry, if you would like to come forward. <clears throat> Jerry M. Anderson, by the authority invested in me as president of the Board of Trustees of Ball State University, I hereby install you as ninth president of the university and invest you with all the power and authority pertaining to that office. Now, I think I, there's something here that should be... <laughs> As a token of this authority, I now bestow upon you the presidential medallion, which shall serve as a symbol of your office. Congratulations. Thank you. In seeking the appropriate person to introduce our new president, we turn to one of his friends and former associates, who both as friend and mentor has been a significant figure in Dr. Anderson's personal and professional growth and development. It's now my pleasure to present to you Dr. Charles Ping, president of Ohio University, Athens, Ohio. Dr. Ping. Governor Bowen, Mr. Bracken, distinguished guests, members of the Ball State University family, friends. Each of the stages, 